Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me. You are always most welcome. So, welcome to Matchbox March and we have got something a little bit different for you. So, we've obviously talked about Matchbox and it's their 50th anniversary year this year. Uh, the parent company, of course, was set up way back in 1947, but the Lesney company set up this model kit division in 1972. And today's show is uh, very much uh, made possible by a good friend of the channel, Paul Hunter, who's um, one of the viewers and subscribers from North Yorkshire, from Harrogate. He has sent me uh, on loan some very, very interesting items, uh, including uh, a book about the history of Matchbox kits, which I'm very, very impressed by. Uh, it's actually by a French guy. Um, one or two things I think get, get occasionally lost in translation, but most of it is just gold, you know, some great illustrations. Um, and also he's got a, a really uh, extensive collection of the original, including the original 1973 little uh, catalogue, which I, I must admit, I never saw that before. I think the first one I saw was the 75, 76 catalogue. We'll get into them later. Anyway. Thanks to, thanks to Paul, uh, he has made today's show possible, so uh, I think everybody who enjoys it, really, we all sort of have a drink, you know. <laughs> anyway, we'll get cracking. Now, I've got in the background here a few of my marvellous, and maybe not so marvellous, examples uh, of a few of the Matchbox ones. I think you've seen most of them before. Maybe not seen The Tempest. I'm not sure I've had that one out on, on camera before. Um, I've got this uh, Phantom, I'm just going to zoom you in for this. You may remember that when we did the uh, review of the Phantom, um, or looked at it recently, I noticed that, and this is quite typical as you'll all be aware, um, there's quite a few examples where there are slight little changes in the tooling we made. And this was one example, because this has this missing window with no clear part. And a, a window, uh, there's like an a, almost like an A-shaped window between the navigator and the pilot. And in the later iterations of the kit, they kind of fill it in in the mould, it's just plastic. It's, it's there, it's like a frame, but it's no longer an, an open uh, aperture, which is very strange. I don't know if you can actually see it here. Let's have a little look. I'll bring it over so you can get a good look. There we go. <laughs> there it is, the uh, famous aperture. So late, on the later one, that I, and I was... I had one that was an original boxing, but must have, maybe it was just an initial production run. They must have realised they'd made a mistake and had this open gaping hole. And let's be honest, um, I really ought to have done something about that and uh, maybe just use PVA or some acetate in there or something, you know, that was just a bit lazy. Um, but it is very, very odd that they uh, should have made such a mistake and then co quietly corrected it. It's a bit like they did with some of the artworks. Anyway, I'm digressing. I'll put that back. Um, we're going to see a lot of these in this, uh, in this promotional material in the book. So... Without further ado, why don't we crack on and have a look at it? I think we're all in need of cheering up at the moment. We all know the news, the world news isn't very good, and I think we all need to get back to happier times, simpler times, and perhaps more fun times. So this is this wonderful book that Paul has sent us to have a look at. Jean-Christophe Carbonel is the author, uh, and straight away it grabs you, doesn't it, with the, uh, the, the artwork on the front of the book, uh, where it's got what I believe was an alternative um, piece of artwork for the uh, P38 Lightning, 70 second scale, and then the more uh, familiar Spitfire and Messerschmitt BF109E. And on the back, we've got some um, examples of some of the boxes. Um, we've got Monty's Caravan there, and it's the Scammel Truck and Bridge Builder, and the Challenger main battle tank. And then we've also got the Renault and the, uh, the Pack Gun and the half track and the Curtis SBC4 Helldiver that's the uh, the original Helldiver but that's the biplane version which I never had anyway without further ado I shall um, I shall keep you zoomed in and we'll have a I'll zoom in a bit more and we'll have a good look at this let's see what you think and I know it's a bit reflecty so bear with me um, it says here 1973 to 2000. Well, that's technically not. I'll just zoom out for this. Technically, that's not that's one of the things he's not quite got right because they actually set up the company in 72, and I think they started production about November, December 72. And the kits actually came on the market in March, stroke April 73. That's when they first appeared. 
Um, this guy's French, you've got to bear in mind, so there may be some differences in when they arrive in his local uh, market in France. Um, but 72, I've, I've actually got boxes with 72 on. Uh, the Mitsubishi Zero, for example, has got 72 on it. There's, there's three or four that I have. So they were certainly tooled up in 72. The artwork was done in 72 and the boxes, I think, were printed in 72. Um, but they may have not crept into the market until New Year 73 anyway. So we won't worry about that. Let us have a look at... 1973 and this is the range and of course this is where we start off with the, the Spitfire ubiquitous Spitfire Mark 9 not with the best artwork it has to be said not with the best Mark 9 Spitfire either it has to be said any of you that have built this kit will know that the wings are all wrong and got no dihedra on them which is very odd <laughs> so it's not their best whereas the 109 was a nice little kit that was a really nice one um, and he basically outlines here the range um, and he, obviously the, the Hawk Fury was the, uh, the first one and he's just saying here that it's not really the best colour having it in these uh, <laughs> rather technical uh, sprues when you're going to have to ideally paint it in a metallic silver but then again as we all know many of us at that time didn't do that we uh, didn't have airbrushes and things uh, they were around, you know, you get the Humbrel airbrush with the compressed air cans, but there we go. I didn't, I didn't have one of those until about 78. Um, so we've got the Boeing P12E and the Focke Wolf 119, and you've certainly seen the FW190. Got a couple of planes here that I didn't have though, and I haven't got the Lysander, so I really should... I'd like that one, I'd, I'd like the Gladiator. I'm not sure about the Boeing, but these two I think I ought to add to my collection, because they are nice models. Um, and of course the Lysander they also do in the 30 second scale, which is probably even more desirable. Now then, here we go, Matchbox gets the best of the professionals, ex profession's expertise. So what he's talking about here is the way that Matchbox are very clever in that they looked at the market properly. They didn't just copy one manufacturer. They decided to copy several. Um, and the, uh, the stand, the basic stand design, which I didn't really realise, was actually something from Salido. Let's just have a look at this. So this stand design, you can ignore the colour of the plastic, it's obviously clear on a matchbox kit, but the actual design with this ball and cup, right down to the, the shape, uh, with the M shape, you know, that was apparently from Salido and this swivelling stand um, there was also a swivelling version that Frog had as well, so quite interesting. Again, they sort of perfected it, if you like. Here we've got, um, saying that they've got the demarcation of the colour ranges, you know, in terms of pricing, uh, with a different colour, which is something Frog did. Tamiya were the ones that were doing the engraved panel line, so they copied that. Uh, the different coloured uh, sprues something that Aurora, Monogram and Tamiya did to a degree as well, even in, in that time. And then acknowledging the source material uh, is something that, that they started to do. And also uh, presentation of uh, two or possibly three different markings. It's two on the smaller kits and it's three on the sort of red range kits. Um, which is something that um, plastic windows copying the Lindbergh kits, which I've never seen Lindbergh, I have to be honest. I'm not sure they actually copied Lindbergh, it's just, I think it's just a coincidence to be honest with that one. Because uh, Lindbergh weren't a factor in our market uh, at all, I never saw them. I'm not saying they weren't here, but they weren't copied. Gone. Then we get into the, some more of the range. Now, this is where uh, there's the Mitsubishi Zero A6, which is the one I said has got 1972 on the box on mine. I've got a, an original top opening box, which is great. And then you've got some of these adverts that they started putting out in things like children's comics, things like Victor and Warlord, and they started to appear. There's your Huey Cobra, which I did a review on recently, and the Strike Master, and the Alpha Jet, which I'm told is very inaccurate, and always amuses me that the artwork on this particular one it's like Roy Huxley went a bit crazy and had some beer or something and um, well maybe he was on the drugs because it looks like they're going to outer space to me but anyway <laughs> and then he's talking about here about these other things that Matchbox were producing in the market um, plug props I do remember them but I never had one because I think I was a bit too old for that they were like a wacky racist type of toy you know 
couple of buggies. I think they used to wind them up and they used to race along the road, but really aimed at the younger audience, I think that was. Here is going into all the range now, so we've got the Hurricane 2C and the 52 on Mustang, the Northrop Freedom Fighter. In fact, I thought it used to say Freedom Fighter on it, but anyway, perhaps not on that particular artwork. The Nat Trainer, which was the Red Arrows, of course, and the Henshaw 126, nice model. There's the Tempest, which we have just behind us here in the background, as you can see. Maybe not my finest hour in terms of model building or painting, but yeah, quite a nice Tempest. It looks like a Tempest. Got that characteristic tail. It's all right, isn't it? Not too bad. Not too bad at all. Um, and then the Jaguar and the mighty Corsair, which again, you'll recall we have right here. He says, trying to get into view. There we go. One Corsair. Complete with its wing, one wing folded. It's like a pigeon like that, doesn't it, actually? <laughs> they, do, they do both fold, as you can see. There you go. Both wings folded up. Uh -huh. uh, and um, this is obviously one where I deliberately didn't paint it at all. Apart from, I kind of felt the paint guide. Now, we'll talk about that in um, some of the other literature that Paul has sent us. There's actually a very interesting advert for Matchbox where it shows all the different variations of how you can present the model at the end from fully painted to not painted at all uh, and, and all points in between where you've used a little small parts colour guide so yeah that's quite uh, this one sort of is the in between stage where I've, I've painted all the fine little small parts like in the cockpit and the pilot but I didn't, didn't go the whole hog so then he goes on to showing the bow fighter which of course we've seen in detail. And then we've got, th I'll just see this a little bit. Got Thunderbolts, Corsair, Messier Smith 262, Brewster Buffalo, Curtis Helldiver, the monoplane version. Then the McCoy MiG 21, Fishbed, Sky Servant, the Dornier, the Buccaneer, showing all its bombs, which it doesn't have. <laughs> And then there's the Harry and of course the Walrus. Walrus is a one that I, I'm told is a nice, quite a nice kit. I've never had that one either, I really want to get it. It's quite a lot when I look through it, but I haven't got one, never had. Had all these though, all the lovely tanks, there we go. This is obviously where the dioramas come in and he talks about... Um, <laughs> the, a lot of the um, data, I'm just going to zoom out, quite a lot of the comment and the uh, content, if you will, in this book really is a lot of its photographs and a lot of the written content is actually uh, kind of reviews from the model magazines of the day. Um, and it's quite funny, he's just saying here about the Corsair, about some of the gaudy colours and apparently Airfix magazine June 1974 said that the main reaction from their readership was yuck when they saw it, that was horrible. Um, and they didn't like this, that and the other, you know. I mean, it didn't move the game forward in terms of scale accuracy, matchbox kits. No, but what it did move the game forward was really how to present your product, how to get it on the shelf and get it off the shelf again as quickly as possible. Uh, and of course it was all about shelf appeal, the artwork, um, and they were appealing to serious models were still buying them. Uh, I think we all know we were. But the ones that were just kids were also buying them, so it, it managed to appeal almost to be a toy and yet also be a serious kit at the same time, especially on the bigger ones. Uh, and it was it was kind of um, the, the secret to their success, really. I mean, you know, Airfix, Airfix would have been better to have actually gone away, had a rethink, and just... All they need to do, to do I think, is just up their quality and just focus a bit more on the presentation. The boxes, which were terrible, I thought they were horrible boxes, they look recycled cardboard, Ugh, horrible. Um, and okay, you know, you say it's environmentally friendly, well, this is 1973 we're talking about, so we, we weren't, it wasn't the primary concern, and they weren't selling as well. You know, these guys, Matchbox, put a big dent in Airfix's sales, and don't let anybody kid you any otherwise, it's, it's going to happen. Then he talks about... Um, in 1974, summer, out came the Sherman Firefly and all the, the armour kits came out. And this is where I think Airfix really started to panic because then Matchbox had definitely moved the game forward in terms of the armour kits by putting in these dioramas. Um, 
And it's, um, it, it continues to amaze me that they've never, they Airfix and others, have not grasped the nettle of the extra appeal that, that gives the kit. And I know a lot of you agree with me. Uh, I'm not going to bang on about it now, but um, it's just astonishing that they didn't recognise and still don't recognise, you know, for another, you know, let's say it's another 15% of cost. All you do is add 15% of your selling price. They're not going to not sell because they are up by 15%. Everything's going up anyway at the moment. It's probably going to go up a lot more soon, the way things are going. Um, so there's no way that price is going to deter people. It's about shelf appeal. You make the customer want to buy the product and price becomes a secondary issue. If it's got that must-have appeal and these had that in space. Anyway, zoom me back in. I'm preaching to the converted, and most people watching this are all nodding on her <laughs> in agreement. Uh, here we go, so you've got the, uh, yeah, we've got in the background, I've got to say, uh, right behind there, we've got the Humber, haven't we? We've got the finished version, and we've got the box as well, right over on the left there. <laughs> nice little kit, that. Just a really nice kit, really, really, and it's quite accurate as well, it's nothing wrong with it. And we've got the Vespi, and we've got the M16 half track, and the Puma. And again, you know, the unpainted model kit suddenly works even better with these kits because it, it more lends itself to a, a toned down, you know, greys and greens that work really well for armour um, and it's not really so much of a problem. And then it's sort of talk about how they moved on in 1976 and 77 and started introducing more. Um, And then that's a very interesting advert, isn't it? They're acknowledging, yeah, that there's criticism out there. Very interesting. Look at this. How our 40p kit shapes up. It depends on who shapes it. So they've got it completely unpainted, which I've got on my Hannah Mag, or totally painted up, you know, uh, modified and all the rest of it. And the, the point they are making is... As I was just saying, really, they're just saying that this is it's up to you. You can have make this kit into whatever you want. You can have a super detail, accurate kit, put the hours in and the painting and extra detailing. Or if you're too young and you don't want to paint it, in, you can choose how it's done. Um, now, you you know you do that with an Airfix kit of the era and don't paint it, and they just look tragic, really. Uh, and there's some strange colours as well, some just dark olive green. Everything seemed to be dark olive green or grey. Uh, and it wasn't the nicest plastic either. So I mean, the plastic quality that the polystyrene that Matchbox were using was really good. You know, it cut well, it wasn't flashy, um, it was durable. Very good, very good. Here again, they're making the same point. Now we see this in more detail. I'll just show you very quickly. Because uh, this is in one of the other publications that Paul has got for us. And again, it's making the same point, this time with the Stuka. You can choose how much you want to do. So the top version is where it hasn't had any painting at all. They did this with a Corsair, they did it very effectively in the, one of the magazines. The second one is where the, the mini paint guide has been followed. So the small parts, things like the bombs and the exhaust, have all been painted. The pilot. And then in the bottom, it's the full... The, you know, the whole nine yards, so to speak, like you might do today, and, and paint it properly, it's been airbrushed, etc, etc. So again, they're making this point that they are appealing to the serious modeler and to the child at the same time. Um, you can always argue it's a bit of a compromise and that they don't, they don't achieve anything perfectly. It didn't matter, they sold these things sold. We all know we bought them, they sold like hotcakes. You know, you looked at the Airfix equivalent, and it was great until you got it home and opened the box, and you were like, oh, it's just this load of flashy grey plastic that was just going to be hard work. You'll have to paint it. Um, I mean, I did a hurricane, I think it was that Mark IV hurricane, uh, with bombs and rockets, and it, I, I wasn't good at painting, I was hopeless, really. And it looked awful when I'd finished. Just a bit of disaster, really, so, you know. These didn't. You could, you could, you could then go back and paint them if later if you felt that you got the skill, modify them, paint them, do whatever. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Another one here where it's got this. Um, uh, this is the armored car, six wheel armored car, not the people, The other one, whose name I always forget. Again, unpainted, completely diorama, totally unpainted, as it came. 
but it kind of works, doesn't it? Um, because the quality of the plastic was so good, it just just goes together nicely. Here we've got our chaffe, which, as you recall, we have uh, we actually made a bit of an effort on this one myself. Here it is. Anything on McCoy? Oops. On its way to the Raymargan Bridge. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you, this is a perfect example, you know, I've, I've done that one properly, you might say, painted it up properly and gentle weathering here and there and blah blah, but on, on most of the matchbox kits I've built, I don't do that because I just like them to have that matchboxness about them, like the Humber Armoured Car where I've only, haven't really painted it, I've painted the figure, I've painted the tyres and things obviously, and done a bit of weathering here and there, a bit of panel line stuff. But nothing too, you know, I haven't, haven't taken it too seriously because I just wanted to have the the model uh, and remind me uh, sort of a halfway house to how I did it originally uh, back in 1976 which if I'm being completely honest uh, wasn't very good <laughs> I didn't do very well at all but there we go digressing anyway, I'm going to flip through these so, um <laughs> Right, seen this. Then we've got Fairy Swordfish and we've got the Stewards of the Orange Range now, so he's going up a grade. Yeah, like I talked about this, <coughs> how did I put it? I said, uh, if you've got some more pocket money and you've been good or you'd help your mum, you help your dad or whatever, you've got some extra pocket money, you could be promoted to the Orange Range and you could have a three colour kit, not two colours but three, and it was like going from being working class to becoming middle class in the English class system. <laughs> yes, you've achieved a certain level of status, you know, and at school you're taking your orange range kit. I'm trying to think what the first one was that I had. I think it might have been the Bowfighter um, or possibly the Corsair. Um, but, you know, your friends at school would be like, oh, you've got an orange range. Wow, you've really, you know, you've arrived sort of thing. <laughs> You've got some uh, hierarchical peer status amongst your friends. <laughs> uh, obviously now, when you get older you do it with cars and things, but anyway. <laughs> well, there we've got the Hawk, we've got the Stuka, and then we've got the cars. Now, I've never had any of the cars. I've never had any of the cars. I've missed out there. Anybody who's got any cars they want me to review and return to them, just send them along. I'm very interested. Do a couple of cars. Bugatti looks very nice. Leaks helicopter, I had that one and I certainly had the lightning, I've got a couple of those today. Don't think I had the Skyhawk or did I? I might have done. I might have done. Um, I had the HS125 because for some reason our post office only went through a period where that's all they had in stock. They had loads of them. <laughs> and I had the Starfighter. Yeah, I had the Hellcat, I had the Mirage, here shown with its drop tanks, which later seemed to magically disappear after about 1978 because <laughs> they weren't included in the kit and he painted them out um, because people complained like me. <laughs> Percival Provost and um, we've got a guy here who's done a really nice um, a diorama with the uh, the armour kits. There we go. Street scene. Got that. It's not the best photograph I'm going to be honest but um, yeah that's nice. And then we've got some of this um, that he talks in the book about the issue I've talked about before about the meddling around de-violencing it. So here's the Messerschmitt 410, which many of you will recall has got a very dramatic scene where it's been dived upon by a squadron of Mustangs uh, and the American B-17 bomber stream above it. All gone. Just a white sky. Just silly, isn't it? Um, and he, he refers to it as political correctness, which is which is right, isn't it? But we won't get into that subject today. Well, I suspect we're all of a similar mind on that one. <clears throat> anyway, HG115, that's a nice thing, isn't it? It's a German seaplane. Not a nice aircraft. Didn't have that one. Did have the, the Lightning and the Heinkel. Where's the original box? Artwork on the Heinkel with the uh, oil refinery at Thameshaven on fire. Here's the later... Goodness knows why they made this different, really. I say it's the later artwork. It's actually the interim artwork of the Phantom because they went to this one. Then they removed the rocket firing as well because that was considered too violent. <sighs> Ridiculous. 
And another nice one here from Roy Huxley with the uh, in the Pacific with the Mitchell bombing and strafing. Also got anaesthetised, you know. Wonderful shot from the Wellington Mark 10. When it, it's quite a heroic story. Unfortunately, the tail gunner was killed and hit by this anti-aircraft fire. Um, but he actually got the plane back and got the Victoria Cross, the pilot. Mosquito. And then we come to something I haven't got, but I did have, and that's the figures. Now these figures, I've got to tell you, they were rather good. They were significantly better moulded. It was like a um, polyurethane type of rubberized plastic. Very similar to what Airfix were doing, but they were dramatically better. Um, the figuring was good, and again, there was, there was no flash on them, and they, it's worth mentioning this. Um, it has to be said that the Airfix equivalents were very, very flashy, you know, and you bought these 30, um, 30 second scale? Yeah, the 30 second scale figures. 30 second or 35th, I'm just checking this actually, prototype. How does he mention it? 132 scale figures, yeah, the 132. I love these, I lo really love them because they're just, it was the same thing, it was just, you didn't need to start putting right what the manufacturer had made a mess of, they were just good to start with. So I painted quite a lot of mine and I certainly had the British and the Germans, I think I got the American uh, infantry later. But if you could pick some of those up, they were, they were good, they were good. And they came out I think about 77, 78, something like that, does it say? Yeah, 78. 78. Um, yeah, but I was most impressed with them. Um, showing here the, uh, the War Hawk, Kitty Hawk, P40. Not Matchbox as fine as now. I don't know what, what went wrong here. Does it mention it? Because it has the most horrible raised panel lines on any of their kits. It's nasty. Um, let's see if there's any mention P40 because it wasn't well received, I can tell you. No, it doesn't go into detail. But here's these. Um, Here's these uh, figures. They then went into the smaller figures, 176 scale, to go with the actual armour kits. So they produced again a range. So I'll show you close up. British infantry, got American infantry, German infantry, and then the Africa Corps and the British Eighth Army. There they are. Now these again were really good. You know, I've got a couple of these still left actually. Just literally a three or four of them. I think I've got. And again, they were, there was a tiny bit of flush occasionally noticed that on some of these, but not like the Airfix one. Um, I think it maybe, perhaps it got more difficult for them to be f completely flush free on such a small figure. But they were acceptable, you know, they weren't really bad, it wasn't obvious. And, you know, again, you put those with your tanks and you've got, a, hey presto, you've got a battle scene. Now he's talking about the new 30 second scale um, sort of super kits that came in. And there's of course is the, uh, the Mark 22 Strat 24 Spitfire. This is one of my most popular videos on Matchbox. Um, I think it's the most popular video of all, for whatever reason. I think I've got well over 10,000 views on just that, that one review. Uh, so obviously it's a very popular kit. I think it was because it was, you know, it was popular aircraft. It was used by Hong Kong. Um, and it was used by the French, it was used by the Brits, I think the Americans had some as well. So I think it was quite a worldwide product, the Canadians I think had some. Uh, quite a lot of countries used that aircraft at the end of the Spitfire's run and I think that's why it sold so well. Which is why people seem to like the video so much. Messerschmitt BF109E, I thought that would be the big seller in terms of the, the video on YouTube, but it's not. It's, it's totally eclipsed by the Spitfire by about 25-30% uh, more views. Yeah. The Lysander, now that's, I was mentioning, that's the one I've never had, that's a nice looking kit, I wish I'd had that. And the Dormus as well, they're both quite nice kits really. And here's a typical advert that they used to put in the magazines and on the back of the, uh, the catalogue, and a young lad with his dad, and they've all got these perfect examples that look really nicely painted of finished matchbox kits, he's got a lovely Wellington there. Definitely a, an airbrush job is that. And that's Maurice Landy himself. One of the designers that he wasn't built in the back of the 81 catalogue, which we will see in more detail. Anyway, moving on, um, talking now about obviously the, the fact that it moved into the, uh, the Red Range, which had three different options. Uh, and then they got into these boats, and again, I have to be honest, I, 
I only had one, maybe two of these. Um, I think I had the Ariadne. I think I had that one. And I think I may have had the Bismarck at some point. There's quite a few here I didn't have. I didn't have, I mean, all the ones on this page, apart from the Marauder at the top, I've not had. So I missed the boat here, really. Canberra. And the Prowler. People say the Prowler's quite a nice kit. Uh, the uh, E6. And then you've got the, the later uh, iterations coming out now, so they've brought out the, uh, the M40 um, and then there's the, which is the self propelled gun of course and then the, the Panzer Jaeger uh, IVL 70 the Morris with the 17 pounder gun and the Willis Jeep Admiral Graf Spey, now maybe that was the one I had, Admiral Graf Spey, I think that's the, the boat I had Yes. and then you've got your uh, armoured car, you've got your pack uh, gun with the half um, half track and BMW sidecar Soviet T34 uh, interesting point about that we'll see that later that there was um, the the early mock up of that was having the longer gun the later version the A10 which they got a bit wrong this is based on the uh, prototype A10 and the, the nose is not right for the later versions Honey Stewart Saab Vigan which I have in my collection um, and then it starts it start to talk about the logos and packaging in the, uh, in the book here. Uh, and some of the spin-offs. Um, now I have to tell you that this is where I think uh, Matchbox were very clever. And they were taking a leaf out of Airfix's book. So what they did, they started to have sort of diorama themed uh, sort of play sets, I think they call them. Uh, play kit, that's it. Um, it's a remarkable photo here, which I have to be honest looks incredibly like myself. This looks like me and a friend I had um, called Simon, I won't name his surname, but it, looked, it looks like the pair of us are playing, and I think we did, with this very set. <laughs> and he really struck my memory at the time, so mum said, it looks like you, and I said, yeah, it looks like Simon as well, the other kid, how bizarre. Um, yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're all thinking, what? The child has got hair. <laughs> well, believe it or not, you know. I had hair and I was really that blonde as well. Um, but that does look like me. And the other kid, his face, he looks kind of like my friend uh, from 1977-78. Anyway, um, this, this other shot, I'm just going to zoom in again. Uh, there's two things here. There's a V1 rocket attack. So they've got like a V1. Quite why they have this farm building in the scene. I'm not entirely sure. But it's got a... It's like they're hiding the V1 in a farm building. And then it's got the V1 launch ramp with it. I can't honestly recall ever seeing that one, if I'm honest. Um, but obviously it was done, you know. And this is the one I definitely did have, which was this sort of like an, like an almost like an Arnhem, like an Arnhem scene. And it had these um, compressed air little cannons that would fire um, bits at the building and it was designed that bits would fall off. So it's very clever, very good stuff. Uh, and that in fact was the, the one that's got me and my friend in the picture. <laughs> Uh, that's the actual box for it. And then it moves on to, zoom you back. It moves on then to uh, the later iterations. So we've got 1978 where they're starting to add more kits into the range. Um, so we've got the, uh, the Douglas Boston Havoc. And we've got the Saab J29F fighter. And here's our old friend which we have just over my shoulder here, just been looking at, the, uh, the Corsair, Corsair 2. And um, one or two friends of the channel I know had this um, uh, HMCS Snowberry, this um, Corvette, which is very popular. This is a big kit. What scale was it? What scale was it? 70 second scale. That's quite big for a boat, isn't it? Big old boat. And here we go. So this is now moving on to the, the era where AMT in America got in bed with Matchbox and they had a, quite a close cooperation. Uh, and they added, they added some more big, this is the green range, so this is the range where you get the really big planes like the Stranra, the Lancaster, Flying Fortress B-17 and the Halifax. Now I had the Lancaster and the B-17 quite recently and sold them very stupidly. <sighs> anyway, you had these big ships, the... Uh, USS San Diego, HMS Tiger, 
the USS Indianapolis, which of course was the boat that carried the first atomic bomb to uh, Tinian, and the Bismarck. And these were rather nice, I've got to say. I wasn't really into boats then, so. We've got the Wellesley, which we've just done a review of, and the Hunter here in the Orange Range, and then they brought in the General Dynamics F-16, Krupp Prots, and the um, Panzer Arborwerfer Cannon, and then we also had the lovely Tiger Moth added to the 32nd scale range. And then they brought in extra for the, for the world sort of uh, American market, they brought in the Anzacs, obviously for the uh, Antipodean friends, and the Japanese infantry as well. Uh, and this is in a small 176 range of figures. Uh, and the Priest, the Normandy style Priest uh, M7, and then you've got the, uh, the Transporter. And then you get into the American stuff, which is not, not so familiar to me, but many of you that are watching, I'm sure, many of you are in the States, I know. I bet you'll uh, recognise this. And they had this crossover where they got these AMT Chevys and trucks and uh, the Avanti. It's quite an interesting, interesting machine. And a Plymouth, you know, look at this. Fire truck pumper, look at that. Wow, I mean, I, I never saw this in the UK. Um, I think they did have them, in, you know, perhaps in London, the bigger stores. And then, of course, when the Star Trek movies came out, 1979 onwards, they they immediately jumped on this AMT and they got the rights to produce Star Trek uh, spaceships. And there was all sorts of stuff coming out. Um, as I say, none of which uh, uh, I don't think any of this was ever readily available in the UK. Back, I've seen some Batman memorabilia, the Hindenburg. That looks quite nice. Interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. And then they brought out, in this corporation, they brought out some more American-styled, you know, appealing to the American market. They brought out some more of those aircraft that would be, you know, from Vietnam. So the Voodoo and the Sky Raider and the uh, the Sea Sprite helicopter. And then they brought, started doing motorbikes. So we got this beautiful Harley Davidson, Barry Sheen's um, Suzuki RGA 500. The very British Vincent Black Shadow from the 1930s, 40s. No, 40s, 50s, isn't it? Um, and then the North American F4B Fury, which was kind of a development of the Super Sabre, wasn't it? And then the Curtis Helldiver, the original version, which I actually think I have that one somewhere. But it isn't complete. And then, sorry, I'm zooming out, zooming out a bit. And then we get a whole load of these different trucks, which, uh, forgive me, I'm not a big truck man, I don't really understand trucks, and uh, they don't appeal to me greatly. But you've got your um, Star Trek shuttle, and the Enterprise, which is very nice. And then you've basically got the reboxing here, you can see how they use the same artwork, but reboxed them with the AMT branding for the States. Which worked very well, you know. And they even did some uh, jigsaw puzzles from the artwork, which I thought was a very good idea. Surprised that never... You know, didn't catch on with people like Airfix doing that, doing it more, you know. Because the artwork was very beautiful on these kits and uh, the vast majority were very popular because of it, you know. Yeah, and he's, he's now sort of pitching around using various photos of the later iterations of these different kits, like the Sea Venom. Uh, I seem to remember, recall somebody may have... Uh, offered me the loan of that and um, if you're listening uh, out there I'm still interested <laughs> and then you got the Handley Page Hayford and the Aerospatial Puma of course which is used by Britain, France, Argentina used them in the Falklands War in fact as well um, and then you got the PB4Y2 Privateer it's a, it's a very sought after kit I'm told that one and then you've got the Charbis and Renault FT-17, the little French tanks, which is a very popular kit as well, actually. Um, and then he starts to talk about them changing the packaging, which we've, all, we've, all, we've kind of covered this already. You can see there with the Panzer, um, Panzer III, how they changed the packing, deviolencing it and sort of ruining it, really, and going to have a lot of white areas. Uh, and getting rid of the window in the packaging to no window and how the colours also evolved and changed which we've, again we've talked about you know here you've got the Hannah Mag where it has the action scene removed and the Nazi emblem is removed as well which is a bit of a shame because it is airbrushing history at the end of the day anyway 
He, he, he does a little thing, uh, a little chapter here about uh, the kits that people wanted Matchbox to do but they never quite got round to it and the various bits of art that were drawn up. Um, I think some of these were actually um, box art from amateurs and they're really good I've got to say, especially that Mustang one looks brilliant doesn't it? Uh, P51B, P51C and you've got the Whirlwind, you've got the Bell X1, you've got the Supermarine Snyder Trophy winner uh, and you've got the fairy fly catcher, which somebody has just somebody's just done a kit of that. Who is it? I'm trying to think. Is it the ICM? Somebody's just brought out a fly catcher recently. And we've got some more trucks. And, and then he's talking about the later um, style of, of of the box art. And we've just covered this, of course. We talked about it on the Sea Harry there. I just did a review, didn't we, a few days ago? And then they've you know. Rather ruined them. I mean, the Red Arrows one is probably the one that's not an action scene. Obviously, it's a display scene. That's that's probably not really, you know, a problem on that one. But on a lot of these war planes, it just doesn't work for me at all. Um, and there's an Avre Churchill tank here. That was a nice one. I think that's a, a kit to try and get your hands on. And then here we got a photo of the <laughs> the geniuses who who created many of these kits. Uh, designers in the design office, Peter Taylor. Paul Martin, Bob Porter and George Turner, um, pattern makers. Uh, I take my hat off to them. I think they deserve a, a medal, quite literally, really. I think they improve model kits, they improve the perception of them a great deal. And uh, they were just of their time and perfect for the 1970s. Here we've got the Victor, of course, which this is one where the Chinese ownership uh, came in. That was, I should have explained this, there is a... a an explanation near the beginning of the book here which explains the the ownership um, the first years up to 78 then the AMT matchbox era and they call it the twilight period when this company Universal Products in Macau took them over started making everything in China then under German control 91 onwards and of course they continue to this day under Ravel but we'll get to that in a second so here we are, talking about the twilight period. Um, what does it tell us here? They started disregarding licenses. The yeah. David Yee Company was only interested in the Matchbox diecast models. This is the problem, isn't it? Um, they brought out some other new items like the NATO paratroopers there and the Auto Union, which were nice. Um, but as I say, this company, Universal Products, took them over and eventually sold on to Ravel in late 1990, early 91, I think. Uh, this is when they re completely redid the artwork for whatever reason. You know, perfectly good artwork to start with, and they changed them all for the for the worst. I think none of those artworks are as nice as the original ones. Not one of them. Just changed for its own sake. I think mainly to rebrand them. Uh, yeah, not impressed, I've got to be honest, I'm sure Probably you feel the same way. Um, they did bring out some new models though, they brought out the, another variant of the Viggen, the Hawk. We had a, an Aeris Scout, of course, which is based on the Jet Ranger, the military helicopter, the GR3, the Harry version came out. Did a few supersets, and then they started bringing out these interesting planes like the Heinkel HE70, which we just reviewed recently, didn't we? Wessex. Sky Knight, gosh, and a Messerschmitt Bollocloth Blom BK117 helicopter, which are very commonly used for search and rescue and uh, uh, air ambulances and all that stuff. And the Challenger tank, of course. And of course, they started doing airlines, which I never had any of these. Uh, one three, they, they, they started doing weird stuff there. I mean, look at the scales: one three ninetieth, one two eightieth, one three twentieth, and one two hundredth. Why? Why would you start to have so many different scales? That is just daft. No, that's crazy. And then the Germans took it over, of course, and the green, the green punkt, the green dot came onto the packaging, still under the Matchbox branding, and then later, uh, basically at the end of the 90s, they, they, they eventually dropped the Matchbox name, and it went to Ravel, and that's kind of the book, really. So there we have it. Um, it's very interesting, it does give you a lot of uh, behind the scenes stories and data about what was going on 
and you can see how the things evolved not necessarily for the better of course especially toward the end um, but it's a wonderful book I, I'm definitely going to get my hands on a copy of this um, I really like it and it does tell the story so nicely and if you're a true matchbox enthusiast you can't can't miss it so it's from a company called Histor Hist Histoire French Histoire and Collections and it's by an author called Jean-Christophe Carbonel uh, and it is a French French publication because of course Matchbox were heavily uh, sort of pro-French France was the second biggest market for Matchbox kit uh, especially in the early two or three years so that's the history of Matchbox story of Matchbox kits 1973 to 2000 I can recommend that I give that I give it a 9 out of 10 <laughs> because I think he does um, yeah, he, he kind of does a lot of quoting about what, but what I don't like this. It's very common today, isn't it, where you get some famous person, a celebrity, or somebody dies, and then you get everybody else what they say about that person. Well, that's not telling me anything about the person; just somebody else's opinion. You know, um, not being too harsh here. It's just that he does that. He quotes from all these magazines. He's not really telling us a huge amount about the early days of the the design. Um, sort of thinking or, or what was being thought of or what steered them in certain directions later it becomes a bit clearer but yeah he, he does a lot of this quoting from all the mo model magazines so I'm not giving a point off for that but I, I've got to say it's a wonderful book I'm definitely going to buy that book I love it uh, just just to flick through and see all those artworks and you do get more of them in there than you get in the Roy Huxley book so for that reason alone really it's worth, worth having you know so thanks to Paul Hunter for sending us that um, 9 out of 10. Hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. And seeing some of the very finished and not so finished uh, matchbox kits in the background. Now don't forget, uh, Mr Hunter has been very helpful by sending us all this literature. We've got a stack more, but I didn't want to do it all in one show. Um, I've now decided I'm going to do... Uh, just give you, I'll just give you a quick flavour. This is the original. This is wonderful. I think I vaguely remember this. I don't remember the one that follows it, but I remember this, this one. It's 5p in 1973 and this was the entire Matchbox product catalogue Les so Lesney, think of it as Lesney it's got all their cars we're going to get into this um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the first um, the first sort of four years 73 to 77 and then I'm going to do 78 onwards because the first four years they only have quite small brochures and some of them are like a, a little leaflet so it's quite it's quite short and easy to get through. You can see straight away how they're evolving their thinking in the design and how they're going to present the products and how they how they're sort of pitching it, you know, selling it to the market against their competitors. Um, so I think that having had a very quick shift, only just before I started filming, uh, we're going to go seventy three to seventy seven, and then probably uh, seventy seven, seventy eight, seventy nine, eighty and then 81 onwards, so that's going to be three videos I think uh, using Paul's material. So thank you very much to Paul, I think we all owe you a beer, um, really enjoyed doing this and uh, I know I'm going to enjoy doing this next bit the most because it's got more photos, more stuff that I, I, some of it I don't remember, some of it I do remember but only when I only was it jogged in my memory when I looked into the, uh, the catalogues. So. I think you should all definitely tune in for this one for the next three vids because you're going to really, those of you that were around at the time in the early mid 70s, you're going to love it I think. <laughs> okay, thanks for joining me anyway, thanks for all your time, hope you found it interesting. Um, please tune in for Matchbox March, the magic of Matchbox continues soon. In the meantime, look after yourselves, if you haven't subscribed already please do so and you'll get early warning as soon as the video is up and loaded and ready. And until next time, look after yourselves, take care, thanks a lot, and bye for now.